The planet is heating up. The oceans are becoming filled with plastic. plastic. Change starts now. Change starts now. We're on a countdown to zero waste. Five, four, three, two, one. This is the Zero Waste Countdown Podcast. Here's your host, Laura Nash. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Zero Waste Countdown Podcast and radio show. On this week's episode, the fourth in the Sustainable Brands Detroit 2019 series, we're featuring Genomatica, a leader in bioengineering and naturally sourced ingredients that skip the fossil fuels. Here's Damien Perriman, Senior Vice President Specialty Products at Genomatica. Damien, thank you so much for joining the show today. Welcome. Thank you, Laura. And uh, what, is your, what is your role at Genomatica? I lead a division that's uh, commercializing specialty products that are made from bio-based materials. Okay, so what is a bio-based material? Yeah, we look at it as where we can make a change in the origin of things. Making a, a, a source decision on using sugars, renewable feedstocks, to make the exact same chemicals or even novel new chemicals that the chemical industry would otherwise use oil or natural gas to make. So you can make things like plastic? Mm-hmm. So that's where we see uh, like bioplastics. So could that be like the cups that we see here at the sustainability conference? Yeah, certainly plastics in themselves are compounds of monomers made into a polymer that's got a particular function. So what we do is we focus on the monomers, the actual building blocks, the ingredients that are used to make a plastic, mm -hmm. or we also make the building blocks that go into cosmetic formulations, or we make the building blocks that go into textiles. If you're looking at apparel, sports apparel, um, nylons, that type of thing. So what we really do is we look at using sugar as a substitute for oil and gas to make those chemical building blocks for plastics and textiles and other personal care ingredients. You're making things like uh, like stabilizers, I would think, for makeup, like that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, chemically, we make dials. And dials are used for cross-linking if you want to make a polymer. Dials are also used for dispersion if you're making a personal care product to being able to suspend other ingredients into a solution. So is a dial like a solution? Yeah, it's uh, a dial is an alcohol. So I mean, okay. a product we're all familiar with, uh, but there's different types of alcohols and a dial has two um, functional groups, whereas an alcohol is a single functional group. And that's what classifies as a dial. And we can use it to mix and disperse and solubilize ingredients. Okay, very cool. So how are bioplastics made? I know you're saying that it's it's the monomer, right? Mm -hmm. And to the polymer. Um, but like, what does a, a factory look like? Or what is the fermentation? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, fermentation is really cool because this is the oldest technology known to man. You know, that's kind of how we first started cultivating crops. There's this desire to get to products that we could then ferment and make things like bread or alcohol or other kind of key ingredients for humanity and progress of humanity. So we're doing this really new piece of technology and a very, very old piece of technology. It's the very combination cool. of those two things. I'm doing it at my home still. <laughs> yeah. So many pickling. of the people at Genomatica do that same process as well because it's a passion of ours. We kind of live and we breathe and we consume and we make things via fermentation. So the plant looks like a brewery. It looks like a same sort of plant you would have if you were making a, a beer or yeah. a wine product. The difference is the downstream where we take the fermentation and we recover the chemical of interest. Then it starts to look like a chemical plant because now what we're trying to do is purify to a very specific ingredient that matches the exact same specifications of a chemical product. So we've got to go through the rigor of classical chemistry in order to accomplish that. But the origin, you know, it's the stuff you can crush in your hands. It's sugar. It's natural. And it's one of the most safest, friendly feedstocks we could possibly work with. Mm -hmm. Can you take us through like a, an example of the, the process? So let's say you have <clears throat> sugar and yeah, you're yeah. growing it in a field. Mm -hmm. And then let's say I take a cup and throw it in the compost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's a long, long life cycle. So let me pick a, uh, Okay, let me pick a life cycle change. So we're working with uh, a couple of groups in Europe around this project Effective, which is about trying to make the supply chain for uh, eco-fashion more sustainable. So where would you start that supply chain? Well, you would start it in the field. Um, a crop is grown. It could be corn, it could be wheat, it could be sugar cane or sugar beet. We crush that crop so we get to recover the sugar. And the sugar is a juice that we can put into a large fermenter 
and we mm-hmm. pitch the microorganism that's been designed to make specifically the ingredient we want, mm-hmm. and it ferments for a couple of days. And then we recover from that an ingredient. And in this example I'm giving, we would be recovering an ingredient like um, caprolactam. Now, that is a molecule that's used to be polymerized. Um, actually, they do a ring closing on it, and it becomes stretchy, and that's nylon. Cool. Nylon six. So that can get spun into a fiber yeah. that then gets weaved into a textile that's then um, designed and cut into a fabric that someone would buy and wear. Wow. Now, when sugar they would clothes. discard that, yeah, exactly, because it's starting <laughs> from sugar instead of starting from cyclobenzene, which is it's a, a petro- very chemical? different petro supply chain. Yeah. But now at the end of life, people can discard that. And the companies we're working with are trying to put together sort of gathering um, processes. So we could pick it up and we could take that and we could kind of cleave it back into its fundamental building blocks and then use it again and use it again so it's two solutions you've got this elegant end of life story of collecting that fabric and bringing back into the recycle chain but you've got this really beautiful beginning of life story coming from in its very origin a natural replenishable starting point Mm -hmm. are there brands that are using that currently that's in development wow Um, that's very exciting yeah it is but what's really exciting is brands are paying attention yeah and actually participating in the discussions at development stages because a company like ours we invest so much heart and soul in science bringing new R&D into development we get to market and the brands are going oh we've never heard of you you do what okay tell us more a few years go by before we even start creating an impact. But when brands get involved at this early stage, like they are in Project Effective, is the conversation start right now on what systems, what metrics, what measurables do they need to put in place and what feedback do we need to take as we design our systems so that it meshes up and it's ready to go as soon as it's ready to go. Right, because how can you know what type of material to make for clothing companies if they don't tell you, I guess? I mean, we're at polar ends of the supply chain, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of information sharing that happens in between, and each one has its own cycle. So if you're doing all of that in sequence, it makes for a very long, very drawn-out um adoption curve or a changeover curve Mm -hmm. so people are frustrated like where are our sustainable solutions we want them now okay if we want them now we need much more coordination of the full supply chain so that we can accelerate that type of journey Mm -hmm. so uh, clothing and landfill is a huge problem that we face now Mm -hmm. so i'm really glad to hear that that you're working on that and uh brontide is something that you work with but what i don't even know what brontide is really (laughs) brontide as a word means that rumbling noise you hear of far off thunder it was a little bit of our irreverent poke at the chemical industry and that changes are coming and it's on the horizon you can hear it it's coming um brontide is our natural sustainable version of a chemical known as one three butylene glycol 1,3-butylene glycol has been around for a very long time. It's made from acetaldehyde. That's a nasty player. It's a carcinogen. It's a mutagen. It's made from ethylene. It's only made in a few places in the world. But that's the traditional way of making that chemical. Does that have like a, a, a use that we would know? Like yeah, it goes use? into what cosmetics. We? we put okay. it on our face. Yeah. It, it's, it's a skincare it's ingredient, and it's a bad actor. Okay. Not the molecule, the way it's made. Okay. So we looked at this and we said, we've got a much better way of making that molecule. Let's go and make it from sugar in a very simple, elegant, single step, natural process, um, natural according to the ISA standard 16128 that governs that, in that we're able to source a natural feedstock and use a biological process to make it. Mm -hmm. And so now we can put this product into our personal care formulations with confidence. We can talk about its sustainability profile as a life cycle assessment. It has half the carbon footprint of petro processes. For every kilogram of that you use, we're sequestering 1.9 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So it's got a wonderful story. It's safe because there's no heavy metals present, and it's used prolifically in the cosmetics industry because it's one of those core ingredients that are found in most skincare formulations. But what is it used for? Why not skip it altogether? Because it actually has a really, really nice skin feel. And it holds moisture. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a humectant and it's very good at being able to hold moisture. It has a slight warming effect as well. And it's very good at solubilizing other materials that you can put in, mix into that formulation. So it's, it's tend to use as sort of one of the four core scaffolding ingredients when you're formulating for cosmetics in that you start with that and a couple of other products and then you mix in other specialty ingredients to get the cosmetic that you're looking for. Would that help it from separating? Yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's dispersion yeah. and solubility properties yeah. help to stabilize that formulation. Yeah, that's good because I can, I can imagine like liquid mm-hmm. face makeup and yeah, it yeah. like being gross and separated if it wasn't properly 
made, right? No one's going to use that. And you can use other ingredients, but sometimes the feel is not right. Like you could use a glycerin and it feels greasy and people don't want that in their skincare applications. So 1,3-butylene right. glycol, which we call Brontide, feels great. It's natural. It's really safe. And we've got uh, high hopes for the uh, industry's adoption of that product, which we've been making commercially for over a year now. Wouldn't that be funny to tell our grandmothers that we're putting sugar on our face? Yeah. I, don't think, I don't think they would quite understand. Well, I mean, that's right, because a lot of people don't understand where things come from. And that's one of the <clears throat> biggest things we want to participate in is more discussion on what the supply chain looks like. Because we've got nothing to hide. As an innovator that works at the origin of things, it's absolutely what we want to talk about. The incumbent industries, the petrochemical industry, whilst it's important to have them a part of the conversation, we also have to kind of recognize this conversation's against their interests. Because when they talk about their supply chain, they're creating a misalignment with the values of their consumers. We're not. We are so well aligned with the consumers. So I think... You mean like their health? Yeah, and- health, safety, natural sourcing, leaving the right impact on the world, giving something to the future of our children. You know, those things are values that really, really speak to us as a company. And that's Good. why we get into the science that we do. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying Petrochem doesn't share those values as individuals, but as companies, they have significant investments in established infrastructure. It's slow for them to make changes. Mm-hmm. Big impact, so little changes make a big difference for them but they're not going to want to revolutionize that's up for revolutionaries like myself and others in my industry Mm -hmm. and you make something called personal care drops Mm -hmm. yeah that was an exciting innovation for us and that came from once we launched a product like bruntide that is a natural sustainable personal care ingredient it gave formulators the opportunity to think about well what else can i do with it where else can i use it a petrochemical ingredient doesn't have that kind of conversation because folks go, ah, oh, it's just more of the same. We've always used it. That's the end of the thinking. But when you bring something new to the market, people's imagination start to flare up. And that's what happened. We're at a conference. Someone was seeing about the, uh, the Brontide launch that we did. They had an idea for a personal care drop that they wanted to make. But the chemistry in our product was um, very compatible with the function they were trying to accomplish, specifically the Brontide in their shampoo formulation has a stabilizing effect to the drop, to the um, outer layer of that drop. So they can use that and the drop is stable. If they use the different alcohol or a different dial, that drop would break apart, which is not good if you're a shampoo drop versus something that's in a plastic bottle. So is this like a Tide Pod kind of, like that kind of Yeah, drop? like you, you get it, there's a shampoo formulation inside. When you wet it, the outer, outer layer dissolves and you're just left with the shampoo. So you're using no rigid plastic packaging. Yeah. But the stability of that outer layer depends upon the 1,3-butylene glycol, which is inside. So it's the combination of those two ideas that this company had the smarts to um, identify that file some intellectual property, and we had the smarts to give them an ingredient that met their needs. So they partnered with you, and, mm-hmm. and this was created. Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine being a scientist and thinking, like, <laughs> okay, we're going to put this liquid in this liquid that is like kind of hard, but then when it hits liquid, which is water, then it's going to turn into liquid. <laughs> like, yeah. It's a bit of a crazy <clears throat> it's, 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 it's a bit of a leap because <laughs> it's different to how we've always used um, those types of pet, um, shampoo and conditioner personal care products Mm -hmm. but the novelty here is that when you bring a slightly different idea to the table people have a reason to think differently like if we just bought the same old same old that's all we would ever be just serving the same old applications which is great because we want change in the industry towards more sustainable solutions but give people a reason to think differently and they start imagining all sorts of new applications which is the future that's very cool. So was that at a sustainable brands conference? Like- no, it was actually at a um, the New York Society of Cosmetic Chemists Suppliers Day. Oh, wow. So it was just us speaking directly to the cosmetics industry. Are now, they- wouldn't it be magical if that kind of conversation can come out of sustainable brands? And I'm hopeful. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it will. There's a lot of good brands here. And so is that company already making them? Like, can you buy those? Yeah, already? you can order them online. What's the company called? Nobo, N-O-H-B-O. Nobo Drops. Cool. That's mm-hmm. very cool. I'll have to check those out. And uh, we already talked about nylon a bit, so that's that's really cool that that's happening. And uh, what are some other interesting products that Geomatica can make? 
We make 1,4 butane dial, so we're a company that seems to like to make dials. 1,4 butane dial is an ingredient that's used in Novamont's made or buy compostable shopping bag, which is available in Europe. Compostable? Compostable. So uh, it's biodegradable and it's compostable. Um, Are you saying compostable? This is an accent thing. <laughs> I'm just saying it Canadian, Com- so I make. I, say my, I just making sure it wasn't a different like science word that I wasn't. No, 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 not. I, I believe we are talking about the same concept. <laughs> Although I hope so, we might find out as the conversation uh, the conversation evolves. So there we get to hit packaging. Um, we get yeah. to hit uh, you know, post consumer waste. We make one of the ingredients in the polymer film that this company then makes, and uh, actually. We developed the technology, they use it to make this bag, and uh, that's been quite popular and it's picked up in, uh, in Italy and in France and the UK. Hopefully it'll come to the United States and Canada soon enough. Yeah. Um, but in order to drive sort of compostable, post-consumer shopping bags, it's not just you make the product, there's a lot of coordination of the infrastructure at the end of the disposal that's necessary to put into place as well. Yeah. And that's an area that they're more experts in, and they tackle that challenge quite, um, quite effectively in Europe. That's what I was going to ask you because there's a picture circulating around social media these days that has a some sort of uh, biodegradable plastic bag that has been buried for a couple of years yeah. and they dug it up and it's still it's still there. It's just a dirty plastic bag yeah, yeah, now. Yeah. So I think people are concerned. But obviously, for a lot of those compostable products, you need something with a windrow system that's very high heat uh, to compost those. So, mm-hmm. like you said, there's challenge at the end of use of the system. So you need to make sure it's being taken to. The, the compost facility or else yeah you know. yeah and there's so many different products in this space and they all have a different story and they all try and tackle a slightly different problem i think the key for consumers is you know if you're going to use a product express a little curiosity and find out where it's coming from and what it's supposed to do mm-hmm. because sometimes we have to take action ourselves discerning actions in the way we dispose of things mm-hmm. in order for it to fulfill its end of life objectives if mm-hmm. we're a little laissez-faire and we assume oh well compostable means this and it means this for all things and we may be missing the impact uh the impact potential that we would otherwise have so mm-hmm. yeah i always encourage folks to kind of look a little bit more into the products that they make in that they're buying and ask those types of questions like what do i need to do to get the most out of this so you make things out of sugar are there other um natural ingredients that you're using are you using like corn or anything like that yeah well it all sort of comes down to sugar sugar is kind of one of these natural building blocks of all life and so when we use corn it's because we want to access the starch which is a form of sugar inside the corn if we're using sugar cane it's because we want to access the sucrose which is yet another form of sugar that's inside that crop um, if we wanted to use biomass the technologies are there where you kind of you break the cellulose up into composite sugar building blocks and then you try and use those as your source of fermentation so but you can also make biomaterials from just collecting natural mass and then compounding that You can also make natural materials from like collecting uh, cellulosic structures and trying to make plastics from from those types of structures. It kind of depends on once you get a natural raw material, do you want to take it to a building block and then express it up to something of higher function? Or do you want to kind of transform what's already been built and kind of deal with the imperfections that that has and try and fit that to the application that you're, uh, you're trying to approach? So it just makes more sense to use sugar then instead of like extracting sugar from other things, but it's possible. I mean, sugar is, sugar is the fuel of life. I mean, as humans, we eat sugar to get our metabolic function so that we can have energy to move, to act, to think. Sugar is what gives us that power. In biology, it's much the same way. You know, microorganisms feed upon sugar to grow. When we design microorganisms for specific functions, what we're doing is we're kind of reprogramming them to use the sugar to make what we want them to make. Mm -hmm. Instead of stockpiling their fat supplies, which biology makes ethanol as a energy reservoir for some future stress that they may undergo. So we like to reprogram that circuit so biology makes the chemical we ask it to make. And the tools are there. It's magical what we've been able to do in the last 20 years to reprogram that to make biology uh, a servant, a supporting feature for our need to progress. So you've been doing this work for 20 years. <laughs> I've been working in green chemistry for 20 years. I've been working with biology for more like the last 10. Um, for me, I started in the coatings industry looking at trying to minimize solvents and uh, environmental air emissions. Cool. And then I kind of moved through the innovation landscape to arrive at biology. Because again, I like this idea of of not taking from the world what we can't give back to it. And biology gives us that potential to use, but also to replenish. That's the idea of being renewable. What did you take in school? Uh, chemistry. 
Yeah. I studied chemistry in Australia and then I did my MBA at uh, UCLA in Los Angeles. Oh, cool. So for me, it was always about disruptive ideas, but then how do you put it into practice? Right. It's a very good uh, mix. What part of Australia are you from? North Queensland. I grew up in the outback of North Queensland on a uh, cattle station slash sort of mining town. Oh, cool. And so uh, sort of constantly surrounded by this semi-arid environment. We're always out in the environment. We could see how quickly it changes if the mines emitted something that they weren't supposed to emit or if the rains came along and everything kind of got renewed. So seeing that stark contrast in the environment was always present for me growing up. Very cool. So we have a lot of listeners in Australia, so I think they'll be happy to hear your accent. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I've been over here for 20 years, so hopefully they're not too critical of the twang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not too strong, that's for sure. Uh, but you you were talking about sugar, and that kind of reminds me of like candy. And mm-hmm. do you make flavors? Like, Are you replacing petrol flavors? Uh, that's a space we'd like to get into. We're not today. I think it's an interesting area of innovation because um, a lot of the flavors we have can come originally from natural sources, right? Mm -hmm. We're trying to extract some kind of really interesting, exotic piece of uh, biology that's happened. And a lot of synthetic flavors have been about the chemicals industries need to try and find a cheaper way of making those same things synthetically. And they don't always match, but they're kind of close. So there's two challenges I'd love to use biology to address. One is being able to make the exact same flavors and the exact same fragrances that are produced in nature, but in a biological system, because sometimes the synthetic chemistry system hasn't been able to replicate the elegance of nature. And the other thing is I'd like to do it in a way that's an industrial. So we're not actually sacrificing nature. We're not going out and harvesting very exotic crops or exotic plant lives to try and produce these exotic flavors and fragrances to industrialize it. So those are the two objectives I would have. And I think it's a really exciting frontier for companies like mine. So let's say you found this flower in the jungle and Mm -hmm. it tasted really, really good. And you don't want to just go and like take them all from the jungle. Exactly. So you can bring it back to the lab and like analyze it and then try and recreate it, but mm-hmm. with like sugars and stuff instead yeah. of yeah. petrochemicals. Yeah, you know exactly. That's very because cool. the way that that flower or the way that that plant would produce that uh, exotic flavor or fragrance is it's it's a biological pathway. It's a sequence of conversions that would happen inside the plant. We would look to model that. Mm-hmm. Then we'd look to understand how that works, the regulatory system that controls for the expression of that pathway in that plant, and then move that into a E. coli or to a yeast microbial fermentation system wow. so we could replicate it without the need to destroy the flower. Yeah. So they can continue to bloom and also industrializing it enables you to make it much more cost effectively. Mm-hmm. And so you can actually scale to the demand of volume that the industry would have for something like that. So for listeners who don't know, I'm a little bit worried about like uh, food coloring and stuff mm-hmm. because there was a scare in the 70s I don't know if you remember this Halloween came in the 70s and orange dye was found to make a bunch of kids sick and so the FDA banned it mm-hmm. and now there's all these like reds and yellows and stuff and I think that they're safe right but there's just been some scares in the past and I believe it's just because of like the petrochemicals do you know anything I don't know that? anything specifically yeah. on that subject but like let me talk to indigo for a moment you know indigo is so critically important to genes to the denim industry but it's an extraordinarily toxic harmful and process on the environment to produce indigo what is indigo is it just it's, a it's blue a dye. yeah dye? it's a dye yeah um so folks are looking at how can we use biology to make indigo Mm-hmm. Now, we've attempted to in the past, but the economics of it have always been quite, quite challenging. Mm-hmm. So my hope is, and this isn't something that Genomatica is doing, but my hope is as an industry, folks look at problems like that and go, okay, we need to solve for the way we make an ingredient like indigo, or we need to solve for the way we make any of these interesting chemical products that we have value, and let's use biology to replace that production process. Mm-hmm. Again, going back to the origin, and let's change the origin story. Right. Okay. So we did talk about the bio-based plastics at the end of their life cycle. Do you have any ideas of, of ways that we should be dealing with it? Or is it just compost in a facility and we're good to go? Or what you were saying, like the nylon, for example, you can actually recycle and keep using it. Yeah. And so I think it's, it's a, my solution is a little more elegant. Um, elegant. It's a little bit more high level, right? We need to attach the right incentives. So the lovely thing about that nylon story is the reason why that's becoming quite popular now is it's attached to eco-fashion. Mm-hmm. Right. If there was no eco fashion pull, the expense of being able to recover that kind of spent nylon is really, really high. And so therefore there's very little reason to want to do that. You know, what's the reason? Where's the payback for that kind of investment? Mm-hmm. But if you can touch the right incentive, like now there is an eco fashion premium for products that are made using reclaimed or recycled nylon. Now you actually have a reason to go out and aggregate 
because those systems didn't exist, right? Being able to access cheap feedstock is about having an aggregation solution, being able to bring enough of it together so it's got the economy of scale that you can cost effectively then upvalue it into some other supply chain. Ecofashion now gives the incentives, the economic reason, to aggre- aggregate spent nylon. Mm-hmm. And you can have very high prices for fashion because we've seen throughout times that people want to spend a lot of money on fashion if they have it. It seems to be something they want to spend their money on, right? So why not make it a, a good fabric and a good brand? I mean, people don't want to people don't want to go bankrupt because they're trying to save the planet. People just want to embrace change as a part of their everyday life. But the thing is, there's only a limited number of things we think about. And if the products we're thinking about are occupying a higher mind share than perhaps they traditionally did, then there's more appetite, I believe, to pay more for that type of conversation, to pay more for access to that kind of story. Mm-hmm. If we weren't thinking about it, the lowest cost, greatest utility function is always going to win. Mm-hmm. But as soon as consumers start feeling something about that decision, you know, now we're able to take additional incentive and put it to play back in the supply chain to do things like develop new science, R&D, aggregate feedstocks that weren't available to us before and help to address that type of emotional pull coming from the consumers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was thinking more of like the super high-end fashion, you know, yeah. like people who want to spend $1,000 on, yeah. on a shirt or something. So. Right, because they can say, hey, this shirt actually came from a net that was pulled up from the bottom of the Mediterranean. People go, well, it doesn't look like it, but that's an incredible story. <laughs> yeah, I was just wearing stockings yesterday that mm-hmm. came from Swedish stockings and right. they pull nets out of the ocean. They save them from being ghost nets, take the polyamide out, and then they turn that back into nylon stockings and then when you're done you can send them back in and they recycle them into plastic tubs for grease for restaurants so <laughs> it's, it's so fascinating and yeah, they're yeah. really really good ones uh so what do you do in your own life to live sustainably are there things that you you try to do on a regular basis yeah we try to live the ideals that we preach at Genomatica, we have uh, you know a policy of no single-use plastic. Really so we've good. gone through that um, that somewhat uncomfortable transition from having cups at water fountains to actually giving everyone. And what we realized is you can't give everyone an ordinary mug or an ordinary cup. You've got to make it cool. Cool means they actually want to use it. So we had to <laughs> right? invest yeah. a little bit more in that type of journey. At home... So what kind of cups? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested. So we have these, like, uh, these, these aluminium mugs, tins, uh, that kind of Genomatica branded on it. Nice. Uh, they're about 16 ounces. And so uh, everyone got given their own. And uh, you know, every new employee, they can write their name on it if they want. Every new employee gets one because Good. you won't find a plastic cup in the building. Um, and we okay. also replaced all the plastic utensils with actual people can use real real right. knives and forks if they're in the kitchen. Again, trying to sort of eliminate that uh, that um, single-use plastic consumption. But mm-hmm. we also did a lot of education too. So in the screens around our lunch areas, we kind of talk about, you know, what are the statistics of what Genomatica is consuming? You know, we've got a core values team that sponsor beach cleanups where we routinely go out and sort of participate in the community and the environment around us. Oh, good. But for me personally, um, the passion is to help my daughter, who's five years old, kind of understand nature and understand that she has a certain responsibility for it. So we garden together and we kind of talk about um, the impact that I'm trying to make on the environment and nature and the importance of nature and how to respect it. Oh, that's so good. I could never have that conversation with her if I was still working in the chemical industry because to talk about petroleum and petrochemicals just goes way over the top of a five-year-old's head. But to talk about the garden and nature, she gets it. It's beautiful. It's very cool. It probably helps explain why dad is away, like for the, for the whatever, too, right? Because that's that's what I tell my son. I'm You're doing here something and, of purpose. Yeah, I'm like yeah. I'm going down, and he knows that I'm trying to save the world the only way that I know how to, right? So yeah. uh, it's very good. Yeah, kids are are gonna save the world. Although sometimes I go to concerts and see the mess that millennials leave because I'm like that an elder millennial, mm-hmm. and I think we're gonna save the world, and then I'm like, oh, why did everybody leave all this garbage on this concert field? But I think I think the change is coming. So yeah. uh, that's really. Cool. It's uh, it's about the journey, not about uh, perfection, right? Yeah, and, and we're making positive change. So, do you guys have a, a booth at uh, the conference? No, here? no. So, I spoke on a uh, panel earlier this morning about biomaterials, the future and its direction, and that was a uh, really interesting conversation to have alongside Dupont and Brasscam. 
these are companies that have been really doing wonderful things, wonderful initiatives within their organizations to kind of lead the journey, lead the way towards more sustainable, more renewable products. They've been attending this conference for a long time. I see them routinely once a year and you get to kind of check in and see what progress they're making. It's always very encouraging to see the investments and the gains that companies like that are, are undertaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, DuPont mentioned yesterday that they get people asking them for help. Mm-hmm. They're like, hey, you know, we're coming under fire because our products aren't that sustainable. Can you like make us a better plastic? Yeah, product? yeah. And so I guess they're working on that stuff, which is... And what a great privilege they have to have companies come to them and say, here's our problems, can you help solve? Because that's really, the, that's the starting point of, of innovation is you see a problem. You don't invent something without the input of, uh, of need. That's, that's kind of wasted wasted labor. So yeah, it's a true privilege when the market talks to you about what their problems are because now you've got an opportunity to address it. Do you have that too? Do companies come come to you and ask for help? More so. It used to be companies like Japan. <laughs> the big chemical companies would come to Genomatica and really? say, you know, help us design these processes, help oh, us cool. work with, uh, with biology and become sort of more proficient and more adept at it. We still do a lot of that and we have a lot of partnerships with chemical companies. We announced one with Covestro uh, earlier this year, a big initiative in the, uh, in the arena of bioplastics. But we also now work directly with brands. So in our specialties product, we're selling directly to the brands. And there we're starting to, uh, as we establish a reputation for ourselves, get more questions about, okay, help us with this future problem, help us with this future need. Mm-hmm. That's where innovators want to be. You know, what we're delivering today is about decisions we made five years ago. Okay, so what decisions are we making now that will influence what happens five years from now? Yeah. Very cool. Well, it sounds like you're you're on the forefront of uh, of making biomaterials, and it's very fascinating because when I first heard of you, I didn't realize you could uh, use fermentation mm-hmm. to do this this process. So that's very cool because we've had some episodes on on fermenting, and it's very neat to to hear about this. I mean, I think fermentation is coming back. There's products like kombucha that's in the sort of your uh, you know Whole Foods store or just about every bar I go to in San Diego now has a right? kombucha tap. You know, so yeah. you know fermentation is a process that can do a lot of things for us. I personally, I'm a great fan of what fermentation can do. Yeah, so we replaced uh, soda pop mm-hmm. um, with kombucha because we found out that BPA lines the inside of cans. Yeah. So I just didn't want to be giving that to my young son. That makes a lot of sense. So we just make kombucha, which has caffeine in it a little bit. But <laughs> I, I think the fermentation process actually cuts the caffeine. I'm not sure. Do you happen to know if it does? No, I don't. Okay, On I don't the specific chemistry of that, I'm not, uh, I'm not yeah. sure. But you're, you're actually giving me a wonderful idea I want to take back to San Diego because we... You know, as a fermentation company, yes, we have a couple of kegs of beer in the kitchen with taps that HR keeps locked to a certain time of the day. So we try and be responsible <laughs> about it. But it would be wonderful if we could dedicate one of those taps to kombucha. Kombucha. Uh, you know, yet another fermentation product. That would be great. I think I'd find some fans back in San Diego for that one. Yeah, and then you can still drink and not worry about your productivity <laughs> if, you're, if you're drinking too much beer. It's funny that you've got it on lockdown <laughs> to a certain day. <laughs> Again, we're trying to be responsible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Damien, for joining us on the show. And uh, and I just think it's great. So thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Appreciate it. Awesome. That was Damien Perriman from Genomatica. If you like our show and want to help save the world from all this trash we're consuming, please consider donating to the Zero Waste Countdown. You can become a patron on Podbean. You can find me on Patreon. Or you can donate right on the website, zerowastecountdown.com. And if you're interested in seeing a photo of our guests, you can check us out on Instagram. That's zero underscore waste underscore countdown. And if you want to email me, it's laura at zerowastecountdown.com. Thank you for listening, everybody. Thanks to all our listeners in America, Canada, Australia, Germany, the UK, and wherever else you may be tuning in from. Together, we're going to change the world. Change starts now. This is the Zero Waste Countdown Podcast.